This meeting is being recorded. So I see that people are still joining, but maybe I'll already get started. Uh, I'll, I'll just do my quick introduction and uh, people can keep joining and, and then for sure everybody will be here by the time uh, we get to the main event. So hi, welcome everyone. My name is Quinn de Koning. I'm uh, an economist in the OECD. And as many of you know, I am currently working on a, a paper on environmental impacts along food supply chains. Uh, what do we know about them and what can we do about them? And as I was doing that, I realized that fortunately there is a lot of activity happening right now. So there are a lot of new um, initiatives by researchers, by uh, the, by policymakers, by civil society organizations uh, around that, that topic. And it's great that there's all this activity, but I also thought it might be useful to connect those people with each other because not everybody knows what everybody else is doing. So that is the motivation for today's uh, informal webinar. And we'll be holding a few more of these uh, in the next few weeks. So. Um, the idea here is uh, we've organized webinars before, and, and I'm sure that after two years uh, of uh, Zoom meetings, you've also had your fair share of webinars. So we try to do a different format this time. So the idea would be that the first part is uh, half an hour, and we'll have each time one speaker present for something like 20 minutes, say. Uh, and then after that, we'll have some time for Q&A. And that part is recorded. And following that, for those who want to stay, we will do small random breakout sessions. And the idea there is to create some opportunity for people to get to know other people who share the same interests. So that's going to be breakout groups with around five people randomly selected. Uh, you're not required to stick around for that if you don't have the time, but we think it would be a great way for people to get to know each other and, and to meet new people with the same interests. Um, also, if you have any other questions for the speaker and you don't manage to ask them during the Q&A or you want to get in touch with some of the people you met in your breakout room or, or whatever, uh, just feel free to send us an email afterwards and we'll be very happy to connect you all. So with that, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you uh, today's speaker. Victoria de Bourbon de Parme. So Victoria is uh, the lead on food transformation work for the World Benchmarking Alliance, and she coordinates the food and agriculture benchmark. And I will let her explain what exactly that means. Uh, Victoria was previously a corporate lawyer with Allen and Overy and was also a legal advisor with Rabobank, which as many of you know, is a bank which specializes in the agricultural and food sectors. Uh, in addition, she's also a foodie and an amateur gardener, although I don't think we'll be covering those topics, at least not in the first part of today's event. So with that, uh, let me hand the floor over to you, Victoria. Thank you very much, Kuhn, and really great to see so many people join today. And please uh, share any, any gardening or food tips uh, in the chat. I've prepared a few slides for you today just to give an, um, a brief overview of the work we do in food and agriculture, but also um, as an organization sort of at large and, and, and to really see where we have synergies together. So I'm very excited about this session to indeed get to learn, uh, le learn more about each other's work and, uh, and, and, and find means to collaborate. So as the World Benchmarking Alliance, we've, we, we are a nonprofit. Uh, we're funded by governments and philanthropic institutions. And so all the work that we do is publicly available and is really also a, a, a public good to be shared. So we are assessing the private sector. So businesses, uh, whether they are listed or privately held or even state owned, but so any business of a considerable size um, on the SDGs and really have mapped out which are the world's leading companies that are uh, uh, crucial to realize the 2030 agenda. And we do that uh, in close collaboration with many organizations. So there's over 300 organizations that are a part of our alliance. Uh, we have created that alliance as a, a feedback uh, group to make sure that we are uh, assessing companies on the right metrics, that we are building on the work of others, but also uh, to, um, to really work together for impact. So once the data is there, uh, we as an organization try to be as an independent convener, but then make sure that others, uh, others use our data. This can be investors, NGOs, um, but also the scientific community or government uh, institutions. 
So this is a bit of a mapping of how the corporate reporting ecosystem is at the moment. And just to give you an idea of also where we as an organization stand, and also you can identify where, where your organization sits to really mobilize these global agendas. So we have the SDGs, we have Paris Agreement. Those are being translated uh, in some form to um, sometimes uh, uh, science-based targets uh, and, and, and clear guidance. On, okay, what do we want to measure and how and what standards are, are we are we putting these private sectors, but also governments uh, uh, against. Then you have disclosure and data, lots of great uh, initiative uh, organizations like CDP, one of them, to really gather data, make sure that there's um, that there's a sharing of relevant data, uniformity of how disclosure is being realized. Then you have research and analyze, uh, analysis organizations. That's where we consider our position as well as a WBA. So you would have uh, benchmarking initiatives. You have the Access to Nutrition uh, Index, for example. You also have the FAIR initiative. Those are very similar to also WBA. We are in, um, those are part of our alliance as well, those organizations. Um, and those are usually more specified in WBA work is more more uh, systemic and on a, on, a, on a larger sense so very complementary to what others are doing and then at the end you have the users uh, of course the businesses themselves but also many uh, business platforms like WBCSD consumer goods forum but also uh, the international chamber of commerce so we see ourselves as WBA very much sitting at this end of the spectrum, uh, researching the data that is available, making an analysis, peer-to-peer -peer analysis, a clear recommendation to where companies should still improve, and then really mobilizing uh, the users of that data and also uh, facilitating sometimes um, uh, multi-stakeholder dialogue um, and just convening multi-stakeholder parties so that they know what actions are being taken and how we can um, uh, really make sure that the private sector is moving ahead. So our focus is very much to research the private sector and to get the private sector to step up and, and contribute to these uh, important goals to which, of course, they've also been, uh, been asked to contribute in, in light of the SDGs. So you can, in one sentence, you could say that our goal is very much to uh, close the corporate accountability gap, to make sure that there's accountability. Of course, we had the uh, Millennium Development Goals, those are very much uh, government focused now with the SDGs, private sector has been taken on board. Um, but what do we really expect on them and who is monitoring whether they are, uh, whether we will realize the 2030 agenda, where businesses stand on that. And that is very much uh, where we would like to contribute with, with clear sets of data. And and on the right hand side, you see the circle of different different topics, and those are the different areas that uh, we as WBA do research. So we have a benchmark on digital inclusion in different industries of decarbonization and energy. Um, and I'm responsible for the food and agriculture team. So that is what I will be sharing with you today. Uh, so as an organization, we are assessing 2000 companies at large, but 350 of them within the food and agriculture space. And after many uh, years actually of consultation uh, with stakeholders and, and looking at, at the, <clears throat> at the many, many reports that came out out on food systems, um, we came to the conclusion that three thematic areas of focus uh, are crucial in food systems, which is environment, nutrition, and social inclusion. And then, of course, a general governance and strategy is important. A, a, a private a company needs to have good structures in place to really implement those important uh, changes that need to happen in, in these topics. So we've developed a methodology uh, that is applicable to a wide range of companies. Uh, we, uh, so we have developed a benchmark where uh, companies from across the value chain are a part and companies are, were not able to opt in or opt out. So it was really a scoping together with stakeholders to determine which uh, of the companies are crucial to realize the global agenda. So we came up uh, at the, uh, after these consultations with a list of 350 companies, and, and these really span uh, across the globe. They are headquartered in 41 different countries, and they represent 
um, really um, different segments of the value chain. So you would have agriculture input companies, um, commodity traders, um, the animal protein sector, manufacturer, food and beverage manufacturers, food retailers, all the way to restaurant and food service providers. We've tried to develop metrics that fits them all, but of course you have some differences with more the agriculture companies versus the food companies. Um, but the themes, uh, themes like deforestation, themes like human rights are of course applicable to every every company in the value chain and sometimes it's more about sourcing sometimes it's more about your your direct operations but in all instances we say that these companies have a size that they have such an incredible impact that they also need to consider how they bring the rest of the supply chain with them in this transformation so in total we have uh, 45 different indicators spread across these four different measurement areas and you see on the right hand side of course, a benchmark um, make, uh, produces a ranking at the end. We have individual scorecards for each of the companies we have assessed. Uh, so you can find them on, on our webpage with individual rankings, but we compile them in, in a total score. So making up 30% for each of the thematic areas, environment, nutrition, and social inclusion, and a final 10% for governance and strategy. I will not go into the detail of all the 45 indicators, but I'll give you a glance of, of, of the results that we have and all, all the results and for, on all 45 indicators for all 350 companies uh, can be found on the website. I'll, I'll, I'll share a link in the chat after the presentation. But uh, we've published this benchmark in September of last year along the, last side, the Food Systems Summit. Um, and this was a, a, a big research uh, activity, really looking at 350 companies, where do they stand on food systems transformation? And very interestingly, uh, we saw that the top 10 of companies actually is very diverse. Uh, so you have, you have many familiar names on there. Uh, the usual suspects, I say, like Unilever, Nestle, Danone, PepsiCo, which we know. But you also have um, OCP, for example, one of the largest fertilizing companies, a stain toned Moroccan uh, company. You also have uh, Fonterra, which is a, um, a dairy cooperative from New Zealand. And you have Firminich, uh, a Swiss uh, flavoring and ingredients a company so a very uh, uh, mixed bag if you will in this top 10 which really shows you that every company in the value chain can contribute holistically to food systems transformation so it is it is achievable uh, it was only the restaurant and food service uh, provider segment uh, that ranked outside of the top 10 and the first company there was the french uh, sodexo which uh, landed on the 30th place of the ranking so that's the good news. There's uh, there's lots of, uh, uh, being done uh, and, and from, from many parts of the value chain. On the right hand side, you do see that that's a very small margin of the total amount of companies. So you see uh, that, that, that uh, the majority of companies score very, very low. Um, and that is really something we need to mobilize. I also very strongly believe that these companies should come to the table. We shouldn't always just invite companies that are already ahead of the curve, that are already voluntarily implementing all these great actions and that absolutely can do more. But we also need to be much more looking broader and really looking at much more uh, companies that are so huge and have such a powerful uh, role to play in food systems that they need to be at the table and they need to also be, um, be held responsible and, uh, and, and at the end of the day accountable for, for, for how they are contributing. So um, as I said on the website, we have, we have our, our, our key findings. We just recently also published uh, an insights report, which gives you even further dissemination of data. Um, and, and in that, we also try to really pull out uh, the leading practices that are there, even if it's just a few on many of the topics that we looked at, if it's from plastic waste to a responsible marketing or, or, or uh, eliminating child labor, you do have good practices and we wanted to share that with um, in our reports to make to really incentivize companies that gosh maybe your peer is already putting this into practice. Uh, so just to give you an idea about uh, some of the findings in these different measurement areas, um, there's four of them starting with governance and strategy as the first. Um, I, I wanted to pull out that 55 of the 350 companies link their top management remuneration policy 
two performances around sustainable development metrics. This means that they would, um, this doesn't mean that they have all the topics that th they might just have environmental uh, sustainability metrics or uh, more human rights, uh, social inclusion metrics. Um, but but it, is, it is a step in the good direction, but it does also show that the others don't. The others only have remuneration policies on, on financial data. So again, a lot, lots of, 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 um, of uh, work to be done and, and really uh, improvements to be gained. Then in the environmental uh, measurement area, uh, I wanted to share with you, of course, one of the most important targets there, especially, of course, looking ahead on COP27 uh, and the Paris Agreement. We saw that there's only 26 companies from the 350 that have set a target which is aligned with the Paris Agreement. We found that around half of the companies are reporting about their uh, greenhouse gas emissions and how they are reducing it or setting maybe a target, but it's only 26 out of the 350 that, uh, that have aligned that to the Paris Agreement. Um, <clears throat> so that, that's something interesting to know. And, and there's many more figures to be drawn from the data and, and, and in our reports. Then on nutrition, um, zooming in especially on, on food and beverage manufacturers, in this case, I wanted to share with you, there's, there's it's a big group. Um, there's, of course, a variety of companies. Some are vertically integrated, so quite a lot are in also developing their, 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 their own, own brands and manufacturing or producing food and beverages. So 2,233 of them, but only 12 have set targets to increase the proportion uh, of their portfolio with healthier options. So um, uh, while a majority are, uh, are, are, are reformulating, are, are improving uh, nutritional values of their products, but it's just 12 out of the 233 that have set a target for themselves that it should also be reflected in the sales. There should be a bigger portion of their entire portfolio. So those are kind of the metrics that we're looking for. And in social inclusion, finally, uh, there's 21 from the 350 companies that have demonstrated to have a full human rights due diligence mechanism in place. So this is really a holistic set of really make, having an assessment, having a risk analysis, and also having a grievance mechanisms in place and, and plan what, what, what to do with it. So obviously, we're not uh, expecting companies just to report on, gosh, there's no, no human rights violations at all. But we're expecting them to, to, to have a proper due diligence mechanism in place to regularly check that um, and of course that's uh, been, been been agreed already uh, for 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 I think already over 10 years what we are expecting from the businesses so there's a clear expectation and then uh, a clear way forward for companies how they could improve and just uh, moving back again on our role as the world benchmarking alliance so next to this Big set of data that we that we are that we have gathered and what that we are sharing in um, in the public domain. Um, so how do we? Uh, contribute to closing the corporate accountability gap. We do, you know, we have a, a new strategic revision centered around these three points. So we are looking at scaling, strengthening, and sustaining our work. So with scaling, we uh, are looking at these uh, 300 companies in food and agriculture, but the methodologies that we use are publicly available as well. We have developed a toolkit which others can use for, for a subset of companies or, or even tweak it for SMEs. Uh, and we have a um, uh, organizations in India that are piloting this toolkit and, and looking at the Indian food and agriculture segment and using our methodology and scoring uh, to, to do that. So please definitely get in touch if there, there is interest uh, to, to use that work because it's, it's, it's there uh, for, for others as well. The strengthening uh, means that we want to strengthen uh, the collaboration with, with our allies, with the organizations that are working with companies to really make, make them improve. So we call it collective impact coalitions. We In the, those coalitions, we focus on a specific topic. For, uh, for, for the coming years, we will be focusing on regenerative agriculture. We brought together investors, uh, civil society, as well as the scientific community to... to um, align their actions to at least know of what the others are doing. So we can sequence actions and that will be more powerful, hopefully for, for companies and, uh, and, and to come up with, uh, with really changing uh, their, their performances. 
And then the final pillar of our strategy is, is to sustain this work. As I said, this is actually, we see this as a public good and we see this as a stepping stone uh, following on really calling the private sector to contribute to these important sustainability topics. But it's not just enough to ask, uh, to, in, to, to, um, to, to invite uh, the private sector to these agendas, but there should also be some kind of an independent monitoring to uh, ensure that we are realizing the targets that we set ourselves, whether that's in, in, uh, on climate or whether that's uh, on human rights uh, or, or food systems at large. We also see in the follow-up of the UN Food Systems Summit that this monitoring, this seems to be quite a big challenge. Um, so it's very important that from the start, if there's a new pledge or a new initiative to somehow embed an independent monitoring to make sure that companies don't just self-report on how they're doing, but there's an independent assessment to that. And a really great uh, example is uh, a G7 initiative that has been set up last year, um, the G7 Sustainable Supply Chain Initiative. And OECD has been appointed this year by the German presidency to be the secretary of that initiative. And us as WBA, we provide the monitoring. So there is 22 companies that have pledged in, uh, to improve their performance in, uh, along their supply chains uh, in this initiative. And that will be measured by the benchmark, will be measured by us independently, whether they are living up to that pledge. So that is just one example. And as I said, there's many other great organizations doing uh, more specific uh, monitoring and providing indexes on specific topics from human rights, deforestation, nutrition, um, that, that are, are, are really uh, doing great work as well. So let's use that and, and, and make sure that, uh, that we accelerate action through um, through, through, through really incorporating that, uh, that corporate accountability in, in the collaborations we establish. So that's all for now. It's been uh, quite a, uh, a whirlwind of information, but I'm here uh, the full hour for Q&A. Thank you, Kud, over to you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Victoria. So for everyone, if we still have a few minutes now for Q&A, so feel free to either uh, raise your hand in Zoom or if you're too shy, you can just type it in the chat. And actually there was already one question that was uh, directed to me, but I guess it's actually for Victoria. The question was if you could say a little bit more about what goes into the social inclusion indicators, like what kind of indicators are in that benchmark? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. It's it's a very large. So we have twenty four different indicators. Um, uh, of course, respecting human rights is 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 a is, is a big portion. Then pro providing and promoting decent work is another. Acting ethically. Uh, is, is a third, let's say, pillar um, among uh, which our indicators are grouped. And then we have very specific food and agriculture um, um, social inclusion uh, indicators like um, forced labor, child labor, but also um, ensuring the health and safety of, of workers, uh, improving farmer resilience. Uh, so also looking at, um, at living income in that sphere. Uh, and finally, protecting land rights. Those are uh, indicators that we looked at there. Really interesting. I see that Rachel Waterhouse has, uh, has raised her hand. So Rachel, go ahead. Hi, thanks. Yeah, that was really, really interesting. Thank you so much. Um, and it'd be great to get a copy of the <laughs> presentation. I've heard a little bit about the benchmarking work before through um, some of our other teams in FCDO. Um, I, I think my question, you, you might be aware that we've been working, um, we've been convening this government to government policy dialogue on repurposing agricultural policies and support for sustainable agriculture. Um, and I think, you know, the sort of the question that springs to my mind is like through looking at country uh, companies experience, is there is there anything that sort of coming through from companies on what kind of um, enabling environment reforms they're looking for and the kind of sort of policy shifts that help will help them to move forward with this agenda. I don't know if that's something that you look at at all, but I'd be fascinated if you are. Thanks. 
Thank you. Great, great to see, see you, Rachel. We've worked a lot in, with you with your colleagues last year, also in preparation of the G7 initiative. Um, it's I think it's a very important point you raise. I think companies are are, are really um, looking at this. We're, as as I said, we're focusing now, for example, on 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 sustainable uh, agriculture, regenerative agriculture, agroecology, that sphere. Um, and some companies are already putting uh, a lot of effort voluntarily in, I think, to be honest and frank, uh, all, also because of also the, 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 the carbon capture uh, potentials in that, but just a general shift of moving away from subsidies to paying for ecosystem services, I think that general principle is, is a very important one and, and which I see also across the globe. I know I think India in certain, um, certain uh, of, 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 of the provinces is, is working on that. I think the, the UK is really a front runner. Uh, the EU tries to implement that through the farm to fork strategy. So to move away from, sub, from the, uh, the quantity to really also really uh, yeah, paying for ecosystem services that that realizes a more of a true 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 value of the food, uh, so that also the true costs and also the true values are already uh, part of the system. So that's uh, I guess a really important movement. Uh, so hopefully you'll you'll make great strides there. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I, unfortunately, I can't stay, but I, I will reach out to you separately and it'd be great to kind of follow up the conversation. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Cohen. Great. Um, I see that Sarah Bridal also has her hand up. Sarah, go ahead. Hi, thanks so much. This looks really interesting and it's great that it's all publicly available. Um, uh, I just was wondering how practical it is or how feasible it is for us to, for example, apply the toolkit in a project we're doing in Yorkshire in the UK. Do the companies need to actually participate in the process or is it based on the reports? You know, how, how, it sounds like quite a lot of work probably to, to do all of this. That's a great question, Sarah. In, in general, because of the volume and also the high level of research that we do, uh, we always say that we look at publicly available information. So we don't work with confidentiality agreements um, just to promote transparency and, 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 and also because of resources to, to, to manage all of that. But it's, it's, it's less going into detail. So, um, but then it can, and it can be tweaked because um, I guess also in every, uh, every region uh, that there's, there's maybe different weighing to different topics uh, but there's, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'll gladly I'll also put that in the link in the chat. So the toolkit is online, which which has all the topics on there, but also the scoring that we've used, uh, and that's all indicative. It can be based on uh, as, as a sort of inspiration for others to then to then uh, move it forward, or just use use it uh, as as we have done on on the global uh, level. Um, but we tend to to work with with this and um, and do then uh, reach out to companies if we've missed anything that there's a review process. Uh, but it's really up up to the organization to determine itself. Yeah. Thank you. I think we have time for maybe one more question. So um, there's two hands up, but I think my OECD colleague Amy was first. So I'm, I'm sorry to, uh, for the other question. So for the remaining questions, as I mentioned, feel free to send them to me by email and I can share them with Victoria afterwards. Uh, Amy, go ahead. Yeah, thanks a lot, Victoria. And it's really good to know that you have all these indicators. I think my question was around how you use the term transformation, because when you, yeah, like we are doing uh, work on systems thinking and transformational change. And uh, what we find, and right now we have done it more for the transport and the residential sector, and we are trying to go to the food system next. Uh, but in a way, how do you distinguish what might be kind of improvements, but that in reality are kind of fixes to the system we have uh, and distinguishing them from whether industry like these these companies are really uh, transforming the system structure and then you can qualify uh, these changes as transformational rather than kind of incremental changes unmute 
Sorry, sorry, yes. So Amy, I think that's a really good and important point because um, those interlinkages uh, are, are, are something that I think all of us are still learning on, 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 uh, on how they are impacting. So we've tried to make that analysis also in the insights report to see, uh, are there any clear uh, linkages uh, between different topics? Um, but there's, there's a balance to be struck uh, with the fact that, uh, for example, in the benchmarking we do, we say that we don't, ask a company to change their complete business model. So if a company is a snack company and they've pr they produce food and beverages and snacks, uh, we can't ask them to suddenly just sell fruits and vegetables, which is a completely different business model. So within the business model, to improve on the most relevant topics in the system. So in the systems, the, the translation we've made is to identify the crucial topics that need to need to be tackled in the system uh, and also to call upon uh, these different value chain partners that uh, even though you are um, um, a restaurant or a food service provider, yes, you do have a role to play also to eliminate deforestation. And uh, yes, you do have a, a role to play to ensure human rights are, uh, are, 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 are being lived up to and respected also across the value chain. Um, so, so that is the way we've tried to make that translation. But I, I think there's lot, lots of knowledge to be gained indeed in, in the intersections uh, that, that are there. Great, thank you so much, Victoria, for the presentation and, and for the Q&A. And so um, we'll now wrap up this first part. So we'll, first of all, uh, we'll stop the recording. Uh, and then, as I mentioned,